And uh, thank you guys for being here on Good Monday. Uh, it, thank you also, Vlad, and the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, tell you the tale of catching and reversing a quantum jump and what they can teach us and what it can teach us about the special nature of measurements and randomness in quantum physics. Uh, can you guys see okay? I, Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, especially my dissertation advisor, Michelle DeVore, and uh, our theory collaborator, Howard Carmichael. The experiment I'll present to you today answers the following question. Is it possible to get an advance warning signal that a quantum jump is about to occur or not, despite the randomness that is well known in quantum jumps and is inherent in quantum physics? In other words, we know that the time at which a quantum jump occurs is reputed to be fundamentally unpredictable. But could there be, um, just like in some classical phenomena, a difference between a long-term behavior and a short-term behavior? In other words, certain classical phenomena, like say the eruption of volcanoes, while unpredictable in the long run, could possess a certain degree of predictability by an advanced warning signal in the short term. Could quantum jumps possess such a feature? If that at all sounds strange to you, uh, I couldn't agree more. So maybe it's fun to recount briefly the origin of this question. And it all starts in Scotland. Uh, this is a few years ago I attended a summer school where a familiar face to this audience, Howard Carmichael, uh, gave a theory talk on a theoretical prediction on a thought experiment uh, built for atomic physics that can probe this question. However, the talk concluded at the time that testing this question, unfortunately, at present seems to remain far out of reach of experimental atomic physics for the time being. I'll describe why that is in a few slides. Um, however, I, I thought maybe there's a way to actually take this experiment and transpose it into a different domain, that of circuit quantum electrodynamics and overcome the obstacles that we face typically there and be able to realize it. So that's the story I'll tell you about today. So then I worked on this proposal for a bit. I came back to Yale. I presented it. I was really excited. And it got fully and flatly rejected several times. But eventually, I managed to convince people over the next few months that, oh, this is actually perhaps possible. We should really do this. Uh, although a uh, curious anecdote is that the first time I came up and presented this in my group meeting, one of my colleagues stood up in the middle of my talk and started shouting at me, if this is true, then quantum mechanics is broken. I, I was taken aback, and I hope you guys are friendlier than he was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to convince you that quantum mechanics is just fine. But nonetheless, I think this can teach us some new features about the special nature of measurements and randomness in quantum physics. To do that and to tell you this tale, let me begin with what are quantum jumps? How were quantum jumps first observed? And what is this striking prediction of quantum trajectory theory that has never been observed? And why not? And then in the second part, I'd like to share with you how can we actually realize this in a different domain, not that of real atoms, but that of artificial atoms, uh, using circuits, and tell you what are really the results? Can quantum jumps be, in a sense, anticipated and reversed prior to their occurrence? Uh, and before I press any further, let me just mention that this talk is timed at something like 45 minutes, so there's plenty of time for questions and discussion. OK, so what, what are quantum jumps? Well, quantum jump, jumps are a basic phenomena of individual quantum systems. Imagine an atom, an atom that has, say, a ground state and some excited level, which for reasons that will become apparent in a few slides, we'll call a dark state, a dipole forbidden transition. One can stimulate transitions between the two levels. Uh, by, say, exerting a force on the atom uh, through, say, a laser. Perhaps this is a Rabi force at 
some rate omega dg, which can create transitions between the discrete levels, which were hypothesized by Bohr. Ah. Yes. Exactly. At this stage, exactly. So, thank you, Bill. To clarify exactly, this, why we say it's dark, but, you know, if it was so dark that uh, no one could ever see it, we wouldn't really be able to talk about it. So, it's you typically a quadrupole transition or something like that. But it's very weakly coupled to the environment. It's essentially a metastable state. Yeah, where they're protected against the environment. Not that, exactly, exactly. This is, this is in an ion, say, this is your long-lived uh, level or state of the qubit. Or a dim state, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, oh, and I'm going to, I should apologize right off the bat to all the atomic physicists in the audience because I'm going to oversimplify a lot of, a lot of the uh, discussion on atoms. Now, how does the atom make transitions between these levels? Uh, and how does one see those transitions? This is a question that, that Bohr and people were asking around 1913, and Bohr came up with this idea of uh, quantum jumps. Well, the atom just takes a jump between these discrete levels from the ground to the dark state. Uh, now, how does one observe that through either direct emissions or... Well, it's quite difficult. Basically, it took seven years until three experiments in 1986 were able to simultaneously observe the quantum jumps uh, on the ground and dark level. But by using an ancillary excited state of the atom, a so-called bright level, right, because it's strongly coupled to the environment, uh, because of the difficulty in observing the individual photons emitted on this dark transition. Okay, this, I'll describe the demo electron shelving scheme. The way that one reads out the population of the ground state is to link the ground state to the bright state by a strong Rabi drive or incoherent drive which has a rate that's larger than the dark drive. And I'll note that no transitions are allowed between these, the bright and the dark levels. Now, however, before the ground state is ever appreciably excited to the bright level, the bright level decays due to a strong coupling to the environment and emits a photon. Okay. Now, in practice, a handful of those photons, at the time typically about one in a thousand, are collected on a photodetector. What this so-called demo electron shelving scheme allows one to do is amplify the population of the ground level here by scattering a very bright laser tone on the bright transition. So many photons get scattered. Now, what is this? look like. I'm going to jump ahead for just a minute to more recent experiments. I'm going to show you a movie of 15 uh, calcium ions, credit to the flat group. And I apologize, this is not up to the more recent 120 or so forth. But the point will be the same. Uh, we, each dot here represents an individual ion. And what you see is a movie played in real time of exactly the blue light being scattered on the bright transition. Each time the atom uh, is blinking on, you can infer that the atom is essentially in the ground state. Each time the light turns off, the atom must be shelved in the dark state. That's the only way that transition does not scatter light. So what you're witnessing are the quantum jumps of, of ions in real time with your own eyes. Now if we zoom into one of these ions and look at a time trace, what you observe is a measurement record of fluorescence intensity the amount of light scattered on this transition versus time that looks something like this. You see that the record is high, then low, then high, then low, and so forth. Each time the record is high, we know a lot of light is scattered on the bright level. And we can conclude the atom is in the ground state. Each time it's low, we can threshold the signal and infer the atom is in the dark state. So by thresholding, we can declare that the atom is in the G, 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 G when the atom crosses a threshold, when the signal crosses a threshold, we can operationally say that a quantum jump from the ground to the dark state has taken place. And I think many of you have measured these things in your lab. 
Uh, so what's so quantum about these jumps and why are they quantum? Well, in part, they're emblematic of two of the founding pillars of quantum physics, which are discreteness and randomness. There is a certain discreteness associated with the measurement result. And more importantly, the time at which the jumps occur is reputed to be unpredictable in a fundamental sense. Now, since 1986, quantum jumps have been observed in a variety of systems, starting with the single ions, single electrons in a penning trap, single molecules. More recently, in microwave cavities, Serge Hiroshi's experiment, superconducting qubits and cavities, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, atomic point contact, in breath states, and so forth. The list goes on and on. Uh, the takeaway message of this slide is that quantum jumps are a basic, ubiquitous phenomena of open, measured quantum system dynamics. And more recently, quantum jumps play a, a pivotal role in things like quantum error correction and stabilizer codes. Uh, so what more could we possibly say about such a basic phenomenon that's been measured so many times? Uh, well, I'd like to heed this uh, admonition by Schrodinger. And I didn't bring my German accent today, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll just let you read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I know. Well, that one I forgot even further back. <laughs> um, so Schrodinger, as you can see, was quite uh, almost polemically opposed to the whole notion of jumps altogether. He really did not think things jump. Uh, you might wonder why. And he had, he had a big back and forth with Bohr and there was other people like Einstein and so forth mixed in the debate. Whether, are there quantum jumps or they're not? But we'll leave that aside for now. Just say, well, you can see that nothing within the jurisdiction of Schrodinger's equation ever jumps or is discrete or instantaneous or even random, right? It's a first order uh, differential equation that is completely deterministic. The only problem is that it does not explain quantum jumps because quantum jumps involve an open, continuously measured system. Right? So Schrodinger's equation cannot handle that situation. Now, it wasn't really until after these 1986 experiments that a theory was developed to unify open system stochastic quantum dynamics with Schrodinger's deterministic equation, uh, which goes by the name quantum trajectory theory. So I'd like to take this more modern vantage point and try to analyze this typical situation, which we look at of quantum jumps, and try to understand what the prediction there would be. Yeah, I can't remember if it was. It's, uh, it's a good question. I think. Uh, and I'm not a historian, but my understanding is that he really believed in a continuous transition. Because he didn't believe in energy levels either. He thought that they're more like resonances, in fact, and that uh, they're a bit like drums. Uh, you know, on a drum, you see standing waves. Um, and the way you make a transition from one standing mode to another is actually by a continuous transition. So, and the way that you can explain a lot of these phenomena was by resonances. So that's the, if you read these 1952 papers, I read it as that's the angle he's coming from, is that he believes in the fundamental continuity of nature. And in fact, he really hated this notion of levels. <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. <laughs> Valley Bottom, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it's a great question. Um, I guess what I can contribute is, you're right that when these experiments were first performed, uh, and I think this is there's a review paper by Tano where he talks about this. There was a conference right before, I think 1985, if I remember right. Uh, just an audience like this with uh, all the atomic physicists at the time, and they took a poll. Uh, how many people in the room thought that quantum jumps would be observed, that they even exist? these discrete transitions. And about half the audience raised, raised their hand. And then they asked, how many think you will not observe quantum jump? And the other half of the audience raised their hand. <laughs> uh, that I don't know. Uh, but there was, there was some kind of divide. Uh, you know, the origins of that divide, I, I don't, I'm not as necessarily clear on, but uh, maybe it has to do with your background. Exactly. Well, and that's, and that's an interesting question. You know, can you observe things uh, that you cannot observe with the density matrix that you can with, say, trajectories? And I think once you get into uh, the question of real-time feedback on individual quantum systems, you end up in a situation where the master equation cannot reproduce those results. Yeah, I think we might be jumping. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> I think my understanding is that we'll get to it in a second, but the mid-flight time will be very difficult, if not possible, to get out of a master equation simulation. Uh, but I'll leave that as a challenge. <laughs> okay. So it, there is a very interesting whole backstory as to you know, do quantum jumps exist or not? When these experiments basically said they do. I mean, people observe them, right? But let's see if we can actually dive into the story and see who, who was more right in a sense, Bohr, who believed very strongly in discrete quantum jumps that are instantaneous, or Schrodinger, who believed that there is no such thing. And I think this experiment can help answer that question. So let's just continue with this more mod modern vantage point, and suppose for a second that you're a superhero experimentalist. Uh, and you have this amazing ability to perform that same experiment with perfect quantum measurement efficiency. So you can detect, so you can collect every single photon. Uh, not only that, your photo detector has perfect detection efficiency. Not only that, it has the bandwidth that's sufficiently high to res time resolve individual counts. Not only that, it does not have dark counts. Not only that, it does not have dead time. So if, if you have this uh, Christmas wish list, uh, uh, what you would see is a measurement record rather than intent, a fluorescence intensity of clicks, individual discrete point like clicks, denoted by these vertical blue lines, that looks something like this, where you see a forest of clicks when the atom is scattering light and is in the ground state, and absence of clicks when the atom is in the dark state. In this hypothetical world, what you can then ask is, well, what really happens at the time of that last click, where when we say the quantum jump occurs? How does the atom actually make its transition from the ground state to the dark state? And this is a, a question that can theoretically be addressed by quantum trajectory theory. So on the top here, I've zoomed in. I've zoomed into this very fast uh, time scale, this very small time. And if I'm looking at the measurement record, which is a series of clicks, from which one can infer 
the population of the ground state, which is essentially unity, the population of the bright state, which is not appreciable because of the separation of time scales between the coupling to the environment and the Rabi rate, and the dark state, which is essentially empty. Right? This is, when you see a lot of clicks, the atom is in the ground state. On the other hand, when the clicks stop, uh, a long time after that, we know with certainty the atom must be in the dark state. That's the only way light is not scattered. In the middle here, uh, the, the Bayesian update essentially predicts a continuous evolution from the ground level to the dark level. Uh, now you might ask, uh, well, okay, well that's nice, but should I be surprised? Uh, the, the thing that's clicking is a detector. That's right. And this is the, the classical information of the detector. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is 100%. You're right. So the clicks here convey uh, necessarily and unavoidably information about the state and the state update of the atom. Uh, so the click the click occurs in the detector. That's right. Ah, well. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> how can you tell? Okay, well that's um, maybe that might be jumping a little bit. If you will allow me to to get through this. Uh, I, th I think you're right that the way you, what you do with your measurement apparatus will absolutely change the dynamics of the system. Uh, there is this uh, dependency on the two because of the way they're related. Uh, but, but maybe come back to that on the experimental slides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, what is this curve, and why is it smooth? Uh, if you have these discrete clicks and jumps, uh, you know what's going on. Um, well, first, uh, let me answer the simple question: Is it a Rabi rotation? Right. You have a Rabi drive. Um, is this just a Rabi rotation? Well, I'll draw your attention to the fact it doesn't oscillate. Right. And uh, second, the time scale here is something like a thousand times the Rabi rate. So this is a very different process. So it's not a sine wave, it's a hyperbolic tangent. Whereas unitary dynamics is associated with sines and cosines, here we have rather hyperbolic rotation. Ah, thank you. The time scale of this transition between the ground and dark state here is, is something like a thousand times the Rabi period. Uh, that time rate is in fact given by the average time between two clicks. And why is that? And that's going to answer Vlad's question too. Um, well, quantum mechanics, you could argue, is about information. And what's happening here is information is traded between the system and, and the detection apparatus. And the absence of clicks here is conveying information. It says the atom is, uh, no click means the atom is, uh, not emitting a photon, that tells me that, well, maybe it's not in the ground state. Uh, now, on average, how long does it take me to figure that out? Right? If I get a click, uh, I know it with certainty I'm in the ground state, the atom is in the ground state. A little bit of time after that, uh, I could expect another click. Right? This is very likely. Uh, you see that there's a forest of clicks. So initially, after the last click, nothing really happens in the update, in the exchange of information, because of the time scale. Uh, the longer I wait, however, the increasingly unlikely it becomes that the atom is in the ground state. Because it must have emitted a click by now, uh, this would just be you know, probabilistically and effectively impossible. So a long time after the last click, having not seen any further clicks, I begin to learn that there's no way the atom is in the ground state, therefore it must be in the dark state. Okay? And the way this update happens, formally through a quantum Bayesian type of update, uh, produces this this continuous smooth evolution because information is continuously exchanged between the system and the apparatus. Well, right. 
right, so thank you. Um, right now, I'm fo focused on the absence of clicks. Yeah. Oh. That's right. Uh, the clicks are a little perverse because in, some, they, you know, in the theory here, they're instantaneous. But my belief is that in practice, there's still a physical process. There's some finite time scale. We just don't resolve it in this particular dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe in, in a physical situation, in this model here, it's just mo the model is, uh, is a point, is a, uh, point process, it's a Poisson process. Theoretically, but I think in practice, at some level, you would. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I understood. Well, the fluorescence you would see is, is basically on average over these uh, clicks here. Typically, you would miss most of them, but you would, you know, your, your detector has some bandwidth and it would smooth over that and say, okay, I get a lot of counts here, I get very few counts, no counts here. Ah, uh, well, except there's a difference in that the statement is that this is not just a smooth evolution of our knowledge. It's rather the dynamics of the system. So if you measure the system, you would expect to find it in a, here, you would expect to find it in uh, in a certain state that has basically 50% in the ground state, 50% in the dark state. So it says it's, it's an objective evolution. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you pointed out because you just made my job easy. That, that's, going, that's basically the experiment I'll talk about is doing exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> so what he said. <laughs> uh, in other words, uh, <laughs> in, in other words, uh, this is the really bizarre thing is that uh, the prediction is that not just this trajectory, uh, but every single quantum jump from the ground to the dark state here occurs by precisely this curve, okay? So if you repeat this a billion times, uh, you would every time see this evolution. That's the statement. And then what that allows you to do is look at the measurement record and stop at this point in time with some feedback and try to do tomography on the atom and reconstruct the state. And that, that's exactly the experiment I'll, I'll show. Right. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So, uh, the, the, I think the question is, well, what about the absorption on the dark level, or what about those photons? Um, well, in, in some, yeah, that's a bit of a different situation because you're right. There is a channel here. Uh, sorry, is that yeah, am well, I on I the right? Ah, uh, when okay. It, Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so it's uh, actually the downside, the downstream, the way the atom returns back down is, is very different. It does not look like this at all. Uh, so it's, it's a very different process, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. No, this is great. Uh, this, this is really good. I, I encourage questions. So I, I think we'll have, we'll have time. Um, okay, but then let me, let me then maybe make uh, what I think is the most striking part of this prediction is the following, that a deterministic time after the last click conditioned on no further clicks 
and given by this expression, it's predicted that the atoms should always be found not just in a mixture, but a coherent superposition of the ground state and the dark state of having jumped and having not jumped uh, with a definite phase. Okay? And in fact, the superposition should be the same for all quantum jumps that occur in the system. Uh, this, this time that I think Bill was alluding to uh, is given by this logarithmic expression. And I, I challenge you to try to figure this out from a master equation. Uh, in fact, this is one of the things that convinced people when I presented this experiment uh, that this is quite, quite a different phenomenon that usually we look at. Uh, it's also a logarithmic expression. Again, not sines and cosines, but a different uh, domain. Uh, so the, you, you can't expand it. Uh, you cannot expand the log. The log is actually relevant. So you can't do a Taylor expansion. Oh, um, yeah, it's, it's, so what you see here, gamma, omega BG over gamma, that's basically the time between two clicks. That's your information gain rate on the ground level. Uh, and then here you can kind of take a sense that, yeah, it's about a factor of five or 10. So that's, that's how many, it tells you how many uh, uh, one over E decay times you have to wait to see this rise. That's right. Um, so, okay, so what is this, what is the statement? What is the takeaway message? It's that quantum jumps are predicted to be continuous, uh, coherent, and even uh, in a sense deterministic-like in that every single quantum jump that occurs before it's fully completed to the dark state will always be found in a superposition of the ground plus the dark state. So in that sense, we can, uh, this provides an advanced warning, uh, this signal of a click followed by no clicks. Now, why has this never been observed? And that's because it critically hinges on not missing a single click on average. Uh, because if you miss one of those clicks on average, you will completely scramble the time of that superposition and you're just going to wash it out. Okay. And now, as far as we can tell, this is an exceedingly difficult task uh, in atomic physics. Um, so in the second half of this talk, I'd like to share with you how we have tried to test this prediction in a different domain, uh, that of circuits. And, uh, before continuing, I just want to acknowledge uh, prior work in quantum trajectories and superconducting qubits. Uh, but I'll also mention that all of those were in two-level atoms, whereas this is in a three-level atom. And the third level is quite important. So the first step in uh, moving in this direction is how do we propose to uh, take, a, take the atom and replace it with a circuit, which will basically have capacitors and inductors and nonlinear inductors. Um, we first have to create a three-level system, which has a dark transition, dark in, some sen in the sense that it's uh, not exposed to the measurement and the environment. It's hidden for the most part. A uh, kind of natural initial candidate might be the, the fluxonium qubit, uh, which, has, which consists of a capacitor, inductor, and some nonlinear inductor, the Josephson tunnel junction. Uh, however, when I was designing this experiment and coming up with the idea, I didn't yet have these really breakthrough results on the high coherence and long lifetime fluxonium uh, experiments, which Vlad Manicharian's group has demonstrated recently. Uh, so for that reason and a few others, I have instead designed this with a different system, which is two transmon qubits. Each transmon consists of a metal pad connected to another metal pad by a Josephson tunnel junction, where the X marks the location of the junction. So there's one vertical transmon, one horizontal transmon qubit. And these two qubits sit on a substrate, which is this green chip. Here's an optical image of, the, of one of these, uh, where you see the uh, aluminum metal pads on a sapphire chip uh, connected by the Josephson tunnel junction. Here's a nanoscopic image, so something like 100 nanometers across. As you know, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, uh, it's a great question. Thank you. That, that's a great segue into this. This, is, this becomes really a molecule. It becomes a four-level 
molecule because uh, two qubits really form four levels. Uh, and there's certain degeneracies which we will want to lift. So we'll identify the horizontal uh, qubit uh, uh, with, the, with this dark transition. And that will be placed at 4.8 gigahertz. The vertical transmon will be identified with the um, blue transition. And now the fourth level, because of the strong hybridization between these two atoms, which then forms a molecule, will be lifted off uh, from degeneracies by 70 megahertz dispersive interaction. Uh, so in other words, they're higher excited states, just like in real atoms. But for all practical purposes, we can ignore them. We'll restrict our attention to the lowest three levels. And, those are, and these are the anchromonicities for the expert in the we take that chip and we place it inside of a superconducting uh, cavity, which is depicted here. The top is cut out. And we orient the chip so that the cavity fundamental T101 mode, its electric field is aligned with the bright qubit dipole moment. So those two will couple. The other uh, transmon qubit, the dark one, will be orthogonal to the electric field, and essentially they won't couple. Uh, and now we come to an interesting question, which is, well, this is an artificial atom, so it doesn't really come with predefined uh, parameters, frequencies, couplings. How do we really design these in practice? Um, so this will be just two slides on a little introduction. So there's this method I introduced over the last few years uh, called the energy participation ratio approach, which allows us to engineer the Hamiltonian and the dissipation in these structures uh, with percent level accuracy ahead of time uh, and to control all of the parameters very well. So the way it works is we can simulate all of the electromagnetics of these structures, basically solving Maxwell's equations, and understand the eigenmodes. So here you see a movie of the cavity fundamental T101 mode with the electric field contours depicted. We can also zoom in to the chip and look at another mode, which is this qubit uh, mode, where you see the surface current profile on the transmon. That's uh, one aluminum pad, that's the other. And this rectangle depicts a junction. And basically, by understanding all the electromagnetics, we can then uh, construct desired Hamiltonians and desired dissipation. Uh, how well does this work in practice? Uh, well, here I'll show you the agreement over nine different devices, some of them in this geometry that will be used in this experiment, as well as uh, things I did with flip chip multilayer architectures for scalable quantum computing, uh, waveguide devices, and so forth. Uh, the point is that the predicted energy of the Hamiltonian versus the measured uh, agrees very well. So the frequencies of all the modes at the gigahertz level, we can uh, get down to a percent level. The anchromonicities uh, at the 300 megahertz level, uh, strong couplings as well at the 5%, and so forth. We can really go down over five orders of magnitude and engineer the Hamiltonian very carefully. Uh, so, and it's all basically on GitHub uh, and it's open source. So taking this approach and using it to design uh, our artificial atom, uh, we built the device. And here is the bottom half of this aluminum cavity. The top half has been removed and the indium CO linking the two is broken. Uh, you see an input-output coupler that guides waves in and out of the structure and the chip is down here. In middle with the two transmons. That big box is nothing but an LC resonance circuit with the very special inductor which makes its frequency depend on the state of the atom. So the frequency of this resonance circuit condition on the atom being in the ground state is here. The resonant frequency condition on the atom being in the dark state is essentially indistinguishable. And that makes for a hidden uh, protected transition. On the other hand, the cavity frequency condition on the atom being in the bright state is markedly distinct. That allows us to read out in the following way. We drive uh, the cavity at, the, at its frequency when the atom is in the bright state. So if the atom is in the bright state, there can be 10 photons in the cavity. The drive is resonant. Otherwise, there will be no photon in the cavity. And this scheme then provides amplification of the uh, occupation of this transition. Uh, that will be quite important to
to overcome losses in the detection chain. Uh, basically, even in superconducting qubits where we have very high collection efficiencies, we still have at best something like 30% quantum measurement efficiency, which is just not good enough. So this, uh, this protocol here allows us to detect the uh, photons in the bright transition with about 90% fidelity. And we measure in reflection through uh, heterodyne detection. Uh, we place that device at the bottom of a dilution fridge at 15 millikelvin, where the output signal is routed through this quantum amplifier, goes to a high electromobility transistor, and is then demodulated at room temperature by two FPGA boards, which uh, perform real-time filtering of the signal and estimate the state of the atom, feeding it in real-time to a controller, which actuates the control tones in the dark transition, the bright transition, uh, and the cavity. Okay, and this will close the feedback loop. And uh, now that we have, there it is, now that we have built up the setup, let's see if we can go back all the way to 1986 and reproduce what folks observed back then in this different setup. Okay, so what I'll show you here is the, uh, is a measurement record of quantum jumps in this artificial molecule. Uh, of the in-phase and out-of-phase quadratures over half a millisecond. Okay, and here's a trace as it streams in. In the Q quadrature, there's no signal other than occasional excursions to the higher excited states, which we'll reject. In the I quadrature, you see that the signal goes high, then low, high, low, high, low. Just like in the atomic case of the fluorescence, here we have a high signal, a low signal, so we know the atom is in the GB manifold, and here it's in the dark state. Uh, however, unlike the atomic case, what we can now infer is that uh, is a bit different. We can see that when there are zero photons in the cavity, we know we're in the ground state or the dark state. Uh, the color, the dots, denotes the state of the atom estimated by the controller. And when there are five photons in the radio cavity, we know we're in the bright state. So how do we observe clicks? That's a good question. Right. So uh, you can see that immediately after a blue dot, which is a bright state, uh, you always see gray dots. So we know that with certainty, immediately after the emission or de excitation of a photon from B to G, we must be in the ground state. Uh, a long time after the last click, when we did not see any further clicks, eventually we, we know we must be in the dark state. And here I've picked some reasonable time, which, which we're going to explore in the, the next part. So it's basically the time uh, that you have not seen a click. Right. Uh, so in, in the next part, we'll have to basically do tomography to figure out where should we really draw this cut. Uh, exactly. Because now there is, there is a question that, you know, what, what really happens after the last click here? When is it in the ground state and when is it in the dark state? Uh, so at this stage, I've just chosen a somewhat arbitrary threshold, but we're going to explore that on the, on the next slide. Okay. Yeah, this, the, the, yeah exactly. There are all these, sorry, the gray lines and gray dots. Okay, good, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully that clarifies. Uh, so how do we detect the clicks? Well, we do not actually measure the photon that's emitted directly because it's subject to loss, and that would not be high enough. Instead, we look at, we measure it indirectly when we see a de-excitation of the, of the bright level to the gray level, to the dark, sorry, to the ground. Uh, and that's, so when we see a blue dot followed by a gray dot, we say a click has effectively been recorded. Well, that allows us to then ask, what really happens at the time of that last click? Can we zoom into that period? So this brings us to the real-time detection, and which will be based on these two FPGA real-time controllers. Uh, now, let me point out that the time scales are very important here. The time between 
two dart clicks is something like 200 microseconds. Faster than that has to be the uh, time between uh, two key excitations of the bright level. Faster than that has to be the integration time, which allows us to resolve uh, bright versus not bright. And faster than that has to be the information gain rate uh, or the measurement rate, which is eight nanoseconds. Uh, the protocol works like this. Oops. Uh, we monitor the, the record and infer the clicks for as long as it takes. And only we stop when we see a click followed by no clicks for a predefined amount of time, which we'll call the catch time or the mid-flight time. At that point, we'll stop the experiment. And just like suggested earlier, we'll perform tomography, measuring either the x, y, or z quadrature, obtaining a single bit of information. A zero or a one. Uh, we then repeat this four million different times okay. uh, over 10 minutes of tracking. And I'll show you then the reconstructed tomography. Uh, on the bottom here, this is not the time of the experiment because all these experiments took wildly different times. Uh, this is rather the signal, the advanced warning catch time. This is how long did we not see a click for. Uh, and so here's the data. Immediately after a click, uh, we know, we see that the atom is always found in the ground state, just as expected. A long time after a click, seeing no further clicks, the atom is always found in essentially the dark state. Uh, the dots represent the data, and the, the, the theory here is the quantum trajectory theory accounting for known independently measured imperfections, such as the uh, finite efficiency of the measurement, the, T1, T2 of the device, and so forth. And they account, and, and there's a, an interesting discussion I'll get to in a minute about the height of this curve. But the point is that we indeed see in the experiment this tanch like evolution. So the, the theory here is, is produced by simulating the full system, including the, the atom and the cavity. Ah, the, the dots are, yeah, so the dots here represent 4 million different measurements uh, of 4 million different quantum jumps, uh, which, all, which all looked something like this, but, went, but you know, were completely different, had different clicks. Some of them took 100 microseconds, some of them took 500, uh, some of them took 200, some of them took 10 milliseconds. Right, so it's, it's a probabilistic thing. Ah, yeah. So as soon as we see this, uh, this let, let me signal, uh, a click followed by no clicks for this predefined time, uh, we stop all the drives. That variable on the Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, exactly. That's this. It's a, it's a predefined time that we sweep. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Exactly. Is, 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 yeah, some, yeah, uh, yeah, a few hundred thousand. You know, there's something like 30 points. Or, that's right. That's right. Exactly, they're, they're conditional tomography, precisely. Thank you. Uh, yes? Uh, I think the question is, what is the time between these yeah. clicks? Yeah, it's, uh, so it's on the order of a few microseconds. Ah, yeah. Uh, so it's, oh, sorry. I should say it's about one microsecond. So, yeah, what you see here is that this starts at about a microsecond uh, because going faster than that, you're, you're basically just seeing clicks all the time. Uh, so it, at this state, it becomes very, very unlikely to see any further clicks. And this is why you get this uh, evolution condition on not seeing further clicks that steers you from the ground state to the dark state. Uh 
Yeah, exactly. Thank you. This is, this, this is not, if you want the smoking gun, this is just, this could very well be a statistical classical mixture just because we didn't do our timing right. You know, this is just population. Here it's the ground, here it's dark, it's just population. So then the real question is, well, what about the coherence? Right? And that's, that's the, these two curves. So here is uh, the coherence immediately after it clicks is zero. This is the uh, x quadrature of the Bloch vector in the GD manifold. Right? But we see that at about uh, 3.9 microseconds, the mid-flight time, uh, the coherence develops up to about 74% in this case. So in fact, we observe this coherence. We well, might say, why is it not 100%? We understand that to be limited by uh, the quantitatively by the measurement imperfection T1, you know, basically all, all of those things that one can prove. Uh, so, so what do we observe? Well, this is the quantum jump. And down in here in the middle, we see this uh, coherent superposition between the ground state and the dark state with a definite phase uh, on all 4 million different jumps. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. No, we, we do a trick. Uh, we map we map the GD state onto the GB state. Uh, so we, we do pre-rotations uh, that swap the density matrix components onto what we because we can measure B versus not B, and that we have a very high fidelity readout for. I guess I'll point out that the coupling to the bath in this is really all, uh, is, is essentially all through the, for the most part, through the right level. Uh, I mean, I guess in the wigner weisskopf you say you have a continuum of modes coupled to, to your transition, and there's some exchange there. I think that's, I think that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. What, what, so what is, let, let me stop and summarize really quickly. What do we see? What, what is the message here? Well, the message is that according to this data, uh, quantum jumps are continuous, coherent, and even deterministic-like in the sense that all four million of these jumps that all occurred at different times and all had different histories all took the same flight and, the same, and had the same exact uh, coherent superposition. So before any gym completed, it, it was always found at this no-click time with, at, in the superposition. Uh, so the, this axis? Oh, thank you. Yes. OK, thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a really wonderful question. OK, so the question is, well, uh, why is it a plus? Why not a minus? Right? Uh, that's what sets the phase? Uh, and that could come with another criticism, which is, well, you know, you have a coherent rabbit drive. Should I really be so surprised that you have coherence? Um, and even more than that, here's another feature. You have residual coherence. Uh, a long time after the last click, there's still coherence. So let's start with that. Why? Uh, well, as the atom transitions hyperbolically from the ground state to the dark state, it's made as quantum jump. It cannot possibly remain there. Why? Well, because you still have this Rabi drive. So as soon as you're in the dark state, the Rabi drive tries to steer you down back towards the ground state. However, it can also not go to the ground state. Why? Because you're observing that it's not in the ground state. And that knowledge drives a knowledge-based force on the atom, measurement back action, which then uh, stabilizes essentially the atom in to have some residual coherence. This is the balance between uh, the deterministic force and, and the measurement back action force. Uh, so that also explains, in part, the slight this, uh, lower value of the B, including there's some other imperfections. Yes.
uh, you're not seeing any clicks, and you're you're almost not in the bright state at all. There's there's going to always remain a tiny little bit of population in the bright state, even when you're in the, the have jumped to the dark state, because you have two Rabi drives, so they will mix you, and it's that it's that population in the bright state that then allows the atom to come back down, typically, uh, that that can eventually yeah. have a click. exponentially small. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. All right, thank you. Yeah, so to get back to the what sets the phase here, it's it's the phase of this GD drive. And in fact, I can tell you for sure that in the experiment, that phase is drifting all over the place over this 10 minute. We, our generators are not that stable. They drift all over on 10 minute time scale. Uh, so in fact, it's not just the phase of that drive. It's the phase of the drive at the inception of the jump. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the next slide. Uh, so the question is, well, what, what if we can take out this rabbit tone altogether? What if we just turn it off? Well, the quantum jumps somewhere here at the beginning. I mean, something has to initiate the, rabbit, the, the jump. But once it's initiated, uh, you know, what sets the phase? And what if we just turn it off? Will you still see the jump proceed and happen? And that's what this experiment is. So we'll track the clicks for as long as it takes until we, uh, for, until we see two microseconds of no clicks, at which time we'll turn off the dark drive and proceed to measure as before. And here's the experimental results on that. So we, we start with two microseconds where the Rabi drive on the dark is on. At that point, we turn it off and we proceed to measure. And what you see is that even in the complete absence of any Rabi drive, of any deterministic force, of any force linking the ground and dark levels, the quantum jump proceeds nonetheless in almost an identical manner as before you still see the coherence develop. The overall amplitude is a little lower because the process takes slightly longer and it's more exposed to imperfection. Uh, I'll also draw your attention to the fact that now there's no residual coherence because as soon as the atom has jumped to the dark state, there's no longer anything to steer it away from the dark state. Okay. Uh, the overall amplitude is set by the imperfections. And now you can really ask, well, what sets the phase and what really drives it then. Uh, the phase of down here is actually set by the phase of that Rabi drive at the very beginning. But what happens to the phase at, at the middle time actually has no consequence. Uh, in fact, it, the phase just gives it a little initial kick uh, off, of the, off of G towards D, at which point the measurement takes over completely. And then at that point, uh, it's the measurement which is much, much stronger and faster. Uh, that takes over and drives this, this hyperbolic evolution from the ground to the dark state. And I'll emphasize that even though this was based on this quantum Bayesian update, which is typically associated with subjective uh, update of information, we're measuring here the quantum state uh, based on the measurement record. So we're really seeing that the actual system is exactly evolving according to these equations, according to these laws. Sorry? Oh, thank you. 200 microseconds. So you can see, yeah, the period is, is, is much, much longer than this. All right? So, so it's not really the Rabi rate at all. It's the, the time scale of the measurement is much, much faster. Yeah. So what does this say? Okay, this again shows that quantum jumps are uh, continuous, in fact, on the short time scale, while they look discrete on the long time scale in the measurement. But on the short time scale, they're continuous, coherent, and even in a sense, again, deterministic, like in that all four million of these jumps will occur by the exact same process. Not only that, but it tells us that, it tells us what is the process uh, that's responsible for the jump. The drive is merely there to initiate the jump. But as soon as it's initiated the jump, it's the measurement that takes over and actually steers the atom from one to the other, even though there's no direct force linking these two. Right. 
Exactly. Yeah, the tomography is it's the same drive for the tomography, so it's locked to the initial phase. It's self consistent. Yeah. Right. Relative. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. Exactly. So, in fact, what that says is that even if, well, it, it already is doing it, the phase is varying all over, but if you know what it is at the beginning, then you essentially can then track the evolution. Uh, as, long, yeah, as long as it's locked to it, yes. Good. So then the question. When what goes to zero? Uh, ah. When uh, yeah, so the when delta t on goes to zero, it means well, if delta t on is zero, then you never have a drive here. Uh, well, you don't have Rabi oscillations between this level and this level because the the bright level is so strongly coupled to the environment, so it's over damped. So it doesn't oscillate; it it just steady states at omega over gamma squared. Uh, I think. Uh, as long as you have uh, some initial, uh, as long as it gives you some initial probability to be in the dark state, then in a subset of those trajectories, you will always go to that dark state. Yes, there's no kick, then there's no jump. Maybe I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, so let's, oh, sorry, let me, I think there's only two more slides, so we're actually doing, we'll be fine. Um, so can we actually exploit these features, the continuous coherent and the short-term predictability? Um, let's try to exploit it to actually prevent the jumps from occurring. So I will do the same experiment where we monitor um, either keep the Rabi drive on or off, but then we'll apply an intervention pulse uh, of varying phase and try to see what's going on. So we monitor, this, we do the same protocol as before, except we now, at the mid-flight catch time, apply a pi over two pulse of varying control angle. The, the control azimuthal angle around the flux here is going to vary. So we'll do a pi over two rotation. And what you see is that exactly when we rotate around pi over two, or the y-axis, the state being in the x-axis, we succeed in reversing the quantum jump at its mid-flight uh, with 82% success rate. Okay. If we uh, the flip the control axis in the other direction, 3 pi over 2, we accelerate the jump to completion. And this is true both in the case that we have the uh, dark drive on or off, either in presence or absence. Uh, of course, in the presence, the overall amplitudes are a bit better because things happen faster. The uh, black curves here are a control experiment uh, where we do the same exact intervention, but rather at random times as opposed to times uh, determined by the advanced warning no click time. Okay. So this, this shows the reverse at the mid-flight time. Uh, and in fact, not only that, but in this final data slide, we, I can show you that we can do that for any no-click duration. And I'll summarize the open loop and closed loop control in the following. Uh, immediately after the last click, uh, we see that the atom is always found in the ground state. A long time after the last click, if we just monitor the population, we see that it always ends up in a dark state, whether in the presence or absence of the dark rabbit light. Okay. If we now close the feedback loop and apply the intervention pulse that's always uh, the same relative to the drive phase, uh, but the same but with the correct as control angles, theta and phi, for the different points, uh, we can always succeed in reversing the quantum jump uh, with some 
moderate success probability. Uh, so then in conclusion, uh, to summarize, uh, we observed the internal coherence of quantum jumps. Uh, basically, we showed that while quantum, while Bohr was very much right, quantum, we, can, we observe quantum jumps all the time. Uh, they appear on the long time scale to be discrete and fully unpredictable. Uh, but if we zoom into the very fast time scale, in fact, you could say Schrodinger was also right, uh, that they're continuous, uh, coherent, and even possess this degree of predictability. Um, and that presents a little island, uh, island of uh, prediction in, in the otherwise sea of uncertainty, if you want. Uh, we then exploited that property, those properties to reverse these jumps before they occur. And quantum trajectory theory explains all of the, uh, the results with really percent level agreement. Uh, we think this has some interesting applications to continuous autonomous quantum error correction. And more fundamentally, I think it's interesting to think about what this says about the essentially objective nature of the wave function or the block vector. This is the conditional density matrix. So with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions you may still have.